Bonjour Tania Sarah. Oui, Tania Moi, je voulais juste vous rappeler que je suis un peu plus de temps. Donc, les deux personnes qui sont allées dans le bureau en France, c'est des membres du Atal de Rigo, c'est ça Est-ce que vous pouvez faire la présentation Ok, super, merci beaucoup.
Good morning, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Somebody could just quickly give me a thumbs up and the chat would be helpful. Just want to make sure that... Perfect, perfect. First of all, perfect. good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are across the world. It's a very early morning in Ireland, so please bear with us as we begin to work through the technology. We are live on Facebook and, and streaming on the Mauritian Diaspora Survey page, I believe. So I think that, that link will be shared in the chat as well in, in the next few moments. I just wanted to take a, a very quick moment to, to welcome you all and, and to say a very warm thank you to folks. I see some names that have also joined us earlier in the week. So it's great to see some friends back. And we're delighted to say that we're hosting our second webinar to share, share some of our reflections and recommendations from the research journey on the Mauritian diaspora. Well, we have a really interesting addition to the lineup this morning in the form of the diaspora themselves and two folks who have been very, very helpful for us. And we'll share more information on that in, in a moment. But just a couple of quick house rules to begin. And I think Tanya will speak to these more broadly, but just to give you a quick, quick sense of that. As I mentioned, we are streaming live on Facebook. So please just make sure, as we say in Ireland, we mind our P's and Q's <laughs> and we, 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 we remain respectful to, to everybody. I think just for people that haven't been to the first session, just to let you know how you can interact because we are keen for you to, to engage as much as you wish and as much as possible. If you have any chat, any comments or reflections, feel free to use the chat section, either on comment section on Facebook or the chat function here on Zoom. For example, if you have any questions that you want to ask, please feel free to share them either on Facebook, as I mentioned, but also through the Q&A section and functionality of the, the Zoom platform. So I'll pause here for a moment because I want to hand the mic to our colleagues at the IOM for some very short welcoming remarks before we get into the, the wider agenda that, that some of you may have seen. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. And I will now hand to my colleagues in IOM for their contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Emira. Thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, it's great to see a lot of people coming from all over the world. Uh, I will be very, very short. I'm Céline Lemel. I'm the head of the IOM office uh, here in Mauritius. And uh, it's my real pleasure today to be with you, to have you on this, uh, this webinar. So as Martin has said, it's the second one that we're hosting. We have another one to, uh, tomorrow. And um, we are really happy to have participants of the survey that we conducted in, uh, from October to December last year, but also to have people from all over the world, uh, from the diaspora, also from Mauritius, to really re reflect upon the results and the recommendation and to help us think uh, about the future and build the future together. So with uh, no uh, further ado, I will hand over to uh, Tanya for presenting the program. And uh, I would just like to uh, really give a special thanks to uh, our two uh, guests of honor today, uh, who are member of the diaspora advisory group uh, in, uh, that we conducted in, in, in Australia and uh, who will also um, intervene in this webinar. So uh, thank you very much to you. And uh, over to you, Tanya, for uh, the presentation of the, of the, the project. Hi, good morning, everyone. So I joined Celine to thank you all for joining us today. So before jumping into the main part, I think that everyone is interested, which is the recommendation. I will just give you a brief overview of a project. Uh, so some of you might already know who some of you who took part in the in the consultations last year. So from October to December, uh, we conducted a series of consultations in three pilot countries: so Canada, Australia, and the UK. Uh, with the goal to understand and uh, better the size and scales and expectations of the diaspora to strengthen the relationship between diaspora, uh, Mauritian diaspora and Mauritius. Now uh, that we have finalized uh, the result of this consultation, we are, we are very pleased to, to hold this series and to welcome you all around the, from around the world to this session where we will present the recommendations and hear from you on what you will consider as priority so we may better support such initiatives and programs. Um, I also wish to thank uh, the members of the advisory group in the three pilot countries for all the efforts and contribution uh, which made this project a success. 
and as well as everyone who participated in the interviews and completed the, the questionnaires during the, the last round of consultations. So today we have the pleasure of welcoming Mr. Clancy Philip and Mr. Bernard Bussoit, members of the advisory board in Australia. Uh, I also wish to extend my thanks to Dr. Martin Russell and Ms. Emmy Rajiti, who I think most of you might already know by now, the two IOM researchers who have conducted the consultations and worked on the recommendations. So before we start, I will just go rapidly over the agenda. So uh, Mira will start with all the recommendations and then we will have uh, Clancy, Philippe and Bernard Boussois with some uh, reflections on the project. And we can then move on to your feedbacks on the Q&A and uh, discuss about the next steps. So as Martin, I think, already went through, uh, I'll just go through the house rules so your mic would uh, be automatically muted whilst a speaker is presenting but just in case uh, this does not occur please ensure that your mic is muted when someone's speaking and feel free to comment in the chat box uh, respectfully to all participants and attendees in your comments so you can also ask any questions in the q a and we'll try to answer these questions uh, throughout the session the webinar is also being streamed on Facebook, as Martin said, so uh, please bear this in mind. And without uh, further ado, I will let uh, Martin start with the recommendations. Uh, Martin and Mira start with the recommendations. Thank you. Thanks, Tanya and, and Celine. And, and just to, to re-emphasize that, we, we very much see this as a dialogue, so please do engage with, with your comments and reflections in the chat, but also your questions. We, we are more than happy. and. For people who joined the first session, for example, we have heard feedback from that for, from that session and additional questions. So we didn't have time to get to them on the first session, but we'll address them later on. So please do engage and and be be as open and 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 and, and challenging it maybe if you want as well in terms of the questions. It's very much a safe space and an open space, so we welcome all questions and comments. On that note, I will hand over to my colleague. Ms. Amira Ajeti, who was very much the, the brains of this team. So Amira, the, the platform is yours and we look forward to hearing your overview of the recommendations. Hello all, uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, good, good morning and good evening to all the attendees. Um, it's in different time zones for all of you. Uh, for myself here in Boston, it's late, late evening or early morning. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to see the attendee list as well as uh, lots of the familiar names from advisory board members as well as other uh, diaspora members that we have interviewed or spoken to in the past throughout this research project. We're very um, thankful for everyone's inputs. And um, as Martin said, so the webinar we held, uh, uh, the first webinar we already held was uh, very interactive and we're hoping that this one will be too. On that note, uh, for all of you who are uh, watching us on Facebook, as well as those that are on the Zoom platform, please uh, do engage. Uh, please provide us uh, feedback, whether that's positive or whether you have concerns. It's all welcome. Um, it's very useful. And actually, that's why we're here. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll start sharing my screen uh, with the presentation. It has only a few slides, uh, so it's not a, a super long presentation, but we're trying to give you an overview of the preliminary findings. And uh, hopefully, um, you will have questions and we can have a thorough discussion on uh, lots of the recommendations that I'm going to present soon. So um, just let me know in case uh, the screening doesn't share screening doesn't work, but I suppose it should be fine. Um, just one second, bear with me. Can you see the screen now? Yep, yeah, perfect, Amir. Perfect, okay. So I'll continue quickly with the uh, research recommendations. Um, so the 
point of this uh, uh, presentation to you today is to provide you with a overview of some of the preliminary findings of the research. And uh, the outputs of this research wouldn't have been um, uh, doable or successful without all the time and effort uh, that was given to us by diaspora members that we have interviewed, uh, all the networks that uh, were shared with us uh, by diaspora members, uh, as well as their thoughts and their hearts. So we really are thankful and appreciative of all of their time. Um, in the next slide, we'll start right away with uh, addressing the diaspora engagement and why now. Um, it's important to note that, as you see in the cover of The Economist uh, on this slide, uh, diaspora engagement has been out there for a very long time. Uh, this slide, actually, and this uh, cover page of The Economist, it's not new. It's uh, probably a decade old. Uh, and the title, Magic of Diaspora, has been around uh, addressing that topic. However, uh, globally, diaspora engagement is emerging as a key development policy of choice for government uh, in the last decade and recently. Uh, if you look at some data, there's about uh, 100 countries uh, worldwide that have been developing some sort of a framework for diaspora engagement, for engagement of their people abroad. Um, it's uh, passion for homeland basically is a constant for diasporas globally. Hence, we uh, strongly believe that Mauritius uh, should also be a part of this conversation uh, and should be a lead of this uh, conversation as well uh, and to develop a successful framework for diaspora engagement and uh, hopefully build a coherent interaction with its diaspora. In the second slide, uh, we have a uh, diaspora capital as a notion uh, that we have uh, uh, discussed and considered throughout this project quite a bit. Uh, so we were wondering um, to understand what Mauritian diaspora capital entails. Uh, diaspora capital as a, a general is way more than uh, simply remittances or uh, migrants uh, in terms of resources that are available to a country, region, a city, location, or organization. Um, it's made up of people, networks, finance, ideas, attitudes, and concerns for their place of origin, ancestry, or affinity. So um, in the context of Mauritius, Mauritian, for example, uh, it's way beyond, as I said, uh, some of the main uh, notions that we have heard so far in terms of remittances or investments. It's also skills transfer. It's also ideas and attitudes. It's, for instance, ethics of work. Uh, it's a lot of uh, know-how and knowledge that can be uh, brought from diaspora towards the homeland. And uh, in that context, it's also the networks of diaspora, as mentioned in this uh, definition, and uh, helping uh, of uh, basically uh, engaging with the government, as well as uh, building the image of Mauritius abroad. In the beginning of the project, we had to undergo a few series of questions uh, to basically understand what are the next steps and how to proceed in terms of developing a successful diaspora engagement. So it was crucial for us to ask a few data questions such as who are the diaspora? So uh, understanding who are the diaspora uh, in order to understand what activities uh, should be brought upon the diaspora engagement. What is the definition uh, for diaspora? Diaspora. Uh, where are the diaspora? So for this particular project, it was a pilot project and we focused on three key countries on Australia, Canada and the UK. And uh, we have uh, communicated with uh, diasporas from these three countries in various ways. And most importantly, what are they doing? So what are the diaspora doing at the moment in order to understand also uh, as and the following design questions, what are the uh, aims, concerns, and needs and hopes of the Mauritius diaspora? In uh, all in all, this was uh, very much so uh, a beginning of a listening exercise for us. And we only hope that that uh, exercise of listening will continue in the future, especially with the development of a framework for diaspora engagement. And throughout these research interviews and gathering of data through survey, we have uh, noted a lot of information uh, that helped us also understand the design questions. For instance, it was uh, crucial for us to understand that for uh, Mauritian 
diaspora, it's important uh, that we tackle not only how can diaspora support Mauritius, but also how can Mauritius uh, support the diaspora. So engaging with uh, successful diaspora members, but also the vulnerable uh, groups, as well as uh, having a beneficial and mutual relationship of respect, but also uh, trust and um, an ethics of care, which we will also mention later uh, when we talk about the recommendations. It's also very crucial to understand what are the interests of diaspora for their future relationship with Mauritius. And this is something that uh, we also have tackled uh, in the recommendations and some actions that we proposed. Uh, naturally, the next uh, questions that we tackled and uh, thought of were the operational questions that come back to the design questions about what policies, programs, projects can we shape in the short term and midterm, and what is the role of each stakeholder in this work. Uh, so beyond popular belief, uh, the role of various stakeholders goes beyond the government as well as the diaspora. It involves the private sector, it involves non-governmental organizations. They all play a very crucial role in terms of developing a successful diaspora engagement platform. And uh, it was fortunate for us to actually note throughout this research uh, that uh, Mauritius Aspera is actively engaged and has a strong passion for homeland, uh, which is why uh, we simply need to understand the mechanisms to build a culture of diaspora engagement in Mauritius that actually uh, would lead to a successful diaspora engagement. In the next slide, uh, I will go uh, over a brief overview of the methodology without uh, going into too much length. Um, in the context of the methodology used for this research, uh, we have to understand that it was under the time of the pandemic. So basically field work was something that we needed to uh, uh, understand how to tackle uh, with other means of uh, digital research interviews uh, that were undertaken, but also uh, to uh, ensure that there is local ownership of the project and uh, creation of these three Merchant Diaspora Survey Advisory Groups was crucial to that, as well as their time and leadership was critical to the success of developing these recommendations. So we are very, very thankful uh, to the three Merchant Diaspora Survey Advisory Groups that were created in the three countries that we worked in, in Australia, Canada, and the UK. And today, actually, we are uh, very pleased to have here two members of the advisory group in uh, Australia, who will be also explaining uh, this research journey uh, together with us. So I won't go into too much detail there, because they will be probably addressing that. And um, another part of the methodology that was crucial was actually understanding and mapping uh, the diaspora organizations, some of which were more formal and others that were more uh, oriented towards digital development and more informal, well, even considering alumni networks or uh, networks of uh, professional uh, Mauritians abroad in uh, different categories. Another uh, way of gathering data uh, was, of course, uh, uh, having the surveys that were mentioned uh, thus far, gathering survey responses, uh, stakeholder research interviews, and basically any other means of uh, collaboration and discussion with the Mauritius diaspora. We also held various uh, webinars in order to engage in different topics. And uh, we remain thankful for all the time that was given to us throughout this research. It is um, crucial to also note that uh, our research was an independent research. So it is something that uh, we tried to uh, rely across in every communication that we had with the Merchant Aspera because uh, we wanted to ensure everyone that all the information gathered and shared with us was kept confidential and it simply translated into uh, the recommendations and it informed the recommendations that you will see uh, presented today before you. In the next slide, I'm trying to get to the recommendations quickly so that I save on time and we have a fruitful discussions. So please send your comments and questions on Facebook or on the Q&A box here. Uh, the general reflections uh, before we go to the recommendations uh, was that um, the, diaspora, the merchant diaspora is a gendered and generational diaspora. 
when I say gender, that means that it basically is very diverse and that the values of mainstreaming gender is are very important to Mauritian diaspora. They are important also to in the form of the development of the country of Mauritius. So this is something that uh, we need to consider strongly when developing diaspora engagement. Um, another point is the generational point of Mauritian diaspora. Uh, this is also very crucial. There was quite a bit of nervousness from some of the Mauritian uh, diaspora members in terms of uh, the new generations and what kind of connection or relationships will the new generation of Mauritians have with their home countries. In terms of even successing some of these uh, uh, organizations, diaspora organizations that are in different countries abroad, uh, they were unsure of what their members, uh, newer members, uh, younger youngsters would actually uh, develop in terms of the relationship with Mauritius. So it's crucial that uh, the inclusivity is part of the diaspora uh, engagement with Mauritius and that we understand that, uh, new, that the youngster Mauritians would actually have a various, uh, quite a different engagement with Mauritius back home. So this is important to, to understand and tackle when building a diaspora engagement platform. Another uh, fortunate uh, point was that uh, we noted a very strong capacity and propensity of Mauritian diaspora. So there was a very uh, strong interest in engaging with Mauritius and a strong connectivity with Mauritius. It's important to unlock this potential. And to the other point, uh, the next point about transitioning through trust and voice, it's important to do that through a uh, relationship of trust and mutual benefits built through the ethics of care that was mentioned earlier. Uh, it is crucial for us uh, to pass along that the Mauritian diaspora is not homogeneous. It has various interests and uh, it, is, uh, uh, it entails of various groups of individuals uh, that actually want to bring their interests across. And this is something that needs to be kept in mind when developing the diaspora engagement uh, uh, platform. The next slide uh, gets us into the recommendations. And so the system of diaspora engagement for Mauritius is developed of the four strand recommendations uh, that work towards the inward and the outward uh, development, inward in terms of the development of the institutions within Mauritius to actually develop a diaspora engagement that's successful, and external and outwards in terms of the diaspora uh, networks and diaspora individuals in order to develop a more structured approach to their engagement. So if we look at the first trend and the institutional leadership development, it addresses exactly that. So development of the capacities of the government of Mauritius, of uh, diplomatic uh, uh, groups and uh, uh, different constituencies abroad of how to actually develop a diaspora engagement that's efficient. Strand two, on the other hand, diaspora social and cultural capital program addresses exactly uh, diaspora associations and development uh, and strengthening of their efforts and cooperation, and also cooperation with diplomatic missions abroad. Uh, and then we have also strand three, which is um, self-explanatory diaspora human capital program. It uh, deals a lot with a skills transfer that was mentioned earlier, and that uh, seemed to be crucial to a lot of respondents and uh, uh, diaspora members that we spoke to. So they were all interested in actually giving back through their skills and uh, were interested in various programs of skills transfer that were uh, uh, that could be part of the diaspora engagement. And then we have the last trend, trend four, which is diaspora economic uh, capital program. Uh, we will go further into depth of each of these trends and uh, discuss a little bit about some recommended actions. And I say some because these are only a few of the recommended actions. And of course, that uh, they are very flexible and uh, very uh, uh, futile. So we could actually discuss about them further in the Q&A session. If we look at the strand one, 
as I mentioned earlier, it is about leadership development and capacity development. Uh, we have some recommended actions, uh, the first one being establishment of diaspora cell, uh, which is crucial for engagement of diaspora in order to uh, provide a home, uh, institutional home for diaspora engagement and showcase importance of diaspora engagement to uh, government of Mauritius. Uh, this is also crucial because it cuts, diaspora engagement cuts across many different portfolios, including private sector, media, academia, and more. So it's crucial to build that collaboration across uh, sectors. The next recommended action is diaspora engagement training program for government of Mauritius. Uh, there's uh, various best practices uh, in terms of uh, what is happening globally to develop training programs that would help uh, Mauritius uh, institutions within Mauritius, as well as those operating abroad, to actually uh, develop a, a successful diaspora engagement. And the last recommended action of this uh, strand is also uh, very crucial. It uh, uh, entails development of a first national diaspora strategy. Uh, in this case, I mentioned crucial a few times because through this uh, strategy, uh, easily Mauritius could address policy and legislative treatment of various barriers uh, that exist to engagement. And uh, for instance, something that was brought up to us throughout these research interviews quite a bit was uh, the voting rights, as well as quite a bit of other issues that could be tackled uh, through this strategy. Uh, under strength two, we have a few, uh, a few recommended actions as well. Uh, as far as the titles, for instance, the Mauritius Means Campaign, this is a placeholder title, so we'd rather see something that is uh, locally titled. Uh, it's just an example. Uh, this would be developed further, of course. Uh, Mauritian's uh, means campaign is mostly a, a public and cultural uh, diplomacy campaign so that Mauritians can engage more with councils and diplomats and help the development and further strengthening of networks. Something that we have uh, noted throughout these conversation with uh, different diaspora members uh, was that a lot of their networks, while uh, quite efficient within the network, were not as uh, cooperative with other networks in different countries of Mauritians or even with uh, other uh, institutions of Mauritians uh, abroad. So it is important that this is tackled and that this cooperation and network is strengthened so that all the diaspora engagement is absorbed uh, by diaspora abroad. Uh, that goes uh, towards the second recommended action, which is Mauritian Diaspora Leadership Network. So as mentioned earlier, it is important to build tailored networks of uh, various interests. Uh, we have spoken to uh, various diverse groups of uh, members of diaspora, some of which were academics or other were uh, various researchers who were simply interested in engaging uh, with uh, various professionals uh, of similar interests interests in Mauritius or abroad. Uh, so this is something that should be addressed through this recommended action. And then lastly, uh, we have the Mauritian Diaspora Summit, which is basically a gathering of uh, all uh, diaspora members of uh, interest, similar interests and uh, discussing and exchanging ideas. So this is extremely important, but uh, of course, in the times of the pandemic, this is something that needs to be looked into of uh, when is the right time to, to uh, actually undertake this recommended action. And then we have uh, strand three, uh, which is human capital uh, development program. Uh, this entails uh, a few uh, recommended actions, uh, such as Mauritian Diaspora Fellows, uh, considering that the academia uh, world of Mauritians has actually undertaken quite a bit of initiatives already uh, in, uh, in this uh, stage, uh, something like a Diaspora Fellowship Program could be actually the next right step for Mauritians abroad. So it would mean that a lot of the researchers or even uh, academia uh, uh, abroad of Mauritians could come back to Mauritius, uh, Mauritius for, for a short period of time to actually contribute back as well as help uh, various uh, potential students and uh, youngsters who are interested in having internships abroad and developing exchange programs. 
Uh, that brings us towards the Mauritius Mentors Initiative. Uh, so this is an initiative that we uh, had, in, uh, th had uh, entailed a digital platform. We were thinking of uh, recommending a digital platform to provide remote mentorship uh, to Mauritians, uh, whether they're youngsters abroad or youngsters in Mauritius. Uh, this is something that can be done in various ways. So, of course, that uh, beyond the remote mentorship, we could have uh, a different uh, uh, researchers, academia, or professionals who would help various Mauritians to uh, develop professionally, whether that's abroad or in Mauritius or just uh, open networks for them. So, there were different ideas while we were speaking to uh, different members of diaspora throughout these research interviews. And then we have the Mauritius Next Generation Camp, which is something. Uh, uh, that has worked really well globally uh, for different diasporas. So there's a lot of best practices. And this basically would uh, tackle quite a bit uh, what diaspora would like to see for their children. This is something that we've heard throughout the interviews that they would like to see that connection uh, basically continue throughout generations. Um, we then have left the strand four. So strand four, which is diaspora economic capital program. Uh, of course, that the first recommended action within this strand is Mauritian Diaspora Tourism Initiative. Uh, we would consider that this initiative could be a open invitation to diaspora for a certain period of time for them to come back and try to build incentive to come back. The initiative can strategically target second and third generation also uh, to strengthen their ties towards Mauritius. Uh, we have also heard quite a bit about the cost of traveling to Mauritius. So this is something that could also be tackled with uh, various private sector stakeholders in collaboration. Uh, the next uh, uh, recommended action would be Mauritius Diaspora Trust Fund. Uh, this is something that would uh, probably come at a later stage because it needs quite a bit of a strong leadership from diaspora uh, and it can be built in various models and uh, various ways. Uh, the relationship of uh, trust and transparency needs to be at a very advanced stage uh, until then. However, in general, when it comes to the investment journey for diaspora, uh, we have noted throughout our research that this is probably in the mid to long term rather than in the short to mid term uh, recommendation, uh, because uh, at the moment, diaspora has, seems more so interested in philanthropic giving and social development giving. And that takes us to uh, the next uh, final uh, recommended action for this trend, which is Mauritius Diaspora Business uh, Competition. So a lot of the business network already, businesses already operating in uh, Mauritius as well as abroad uh, have a various uh, means of connection. So we have spoken to many of them and this is elaborated uh, quite a bit in the research. Uh, developing a business competition would be very encouraging uh, for actually uh, developing a more successful collaboration between uh, businesses abroad, businesses in Mauritius, and just exploring opportunities of uh, cooperation. Um, this is about it, I think, in terms of recommended actions. I tried to go through them uh, speedily, maybe. I hope they were clear. However, I'm more than happy to elaborate on each one of them as uh, within the report that would be uh, made public uh, uh, quite soon. Uh, you will see that these are elaborated further on. And as mentioned, uh, these are also placeholder uh, recommended actions. So there's a lot more than can be developed around these trends. And uh, it's important to have a structure uh, and a coherent diaspora engagement that would actually benefit all, and it would be in the interest of diaspora. That said, uh, hence your comments, your feedback, your suggestions, or requests for clarifications are very important. And uh, that's the point of these webinars. Uh, it was only fair for us to share these uh, recommendations that actually came from all the discussions that we had with diaspora, as well as with institutions in Mauritius. As a final slide, 
it's a simply thank you slide, but it's a very important slide. Uh, basically, all these outputs would not be possible uh, without all the time and effort put in uh, by diaspora members, by advisory groups, as I mentioned, we are immensely thankful, uh, by Mauritian diaspora everywhere that we have spoken to, as well as by the team at IOM, uh, especially uh, Tanya. Tanya was extremely helpful in coordinating uh, all of the activities in the past year, as well well as this year to date. So we remain thankful for that and we hope we can be at your service. Um, I think I shared in the chat box earlier a link uh, for uh, basically scheduling a one-to-one -one consultation with us. And I say consultation, but it's more a meeting where we can hear your ideas, uh, your suggestions or feedback, should you have time or desire to do that. So basically find whatever means and whatever platform that works for you. And we are here to listen and understand more and uh, develop something that is actually useful for everyone. Thank you again. Uh, Martin, do I go back to you or do we straight ahead go to our uh, members of advisory group for, for their speaking side? Perfect. First of all, thank you, Mira. And, and just to re-emphasize, re please comment and, and share questions. We're more than happy to, to answer anything that, that you would like answered. So I think we just now move to probably the most important speakers of the day in the sense of the diaspora. So maybe if you can just introduce the speakers and, and we go from there. Yes, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the speakers then. Um, I would first uh, call on uh, Clancy, Mr. Clancy, to actually share with us the journey of this research as well as provide us with feedback on recommendations. Uh, thank you again in advance and uh, happy to hear uh, your story. Okay. Am I on now? Yes, yes, you're on. Please go yeah. ahead. It's it's been quite an uh, an interesting journey to the point that it came out of the blue, and there were a lot of questions asked in the first place. And the most important question was, what is it all about? And initially, we were not too sure what it was going to lead to, but I think eventually as we went through and got things explained, it became clearer and clearer. There's still a lot of questions that people are still asking. One of the things is that, like I'm talking about the Mauritian diaspora from my perspective, in especially in Melbourne in Australia, there's a lot of diaspora capital here that really wants to connect with Mauritius. But the unfortunate experience has been it's been almost like a one way type of uh, movement. Like was there was a lot of willingness about Mauritians in Australia to connect with Mauritius, but in return, the connection wasn't there. And that took a lot of discussion and a lot of time. In fact, to the point that there was some sort of mistrust in between, in between the two. But eventually I think at least it's something that's being put together to actually address that. There's a lot of work to be done in terms of uh, exploiting this capital and about what sort of connection can we have. The next one was the, the interest of the Mauritian diaspora in uh, Australia about connecting. The Mauritian diaspora in Australia is a bit fragmented in certain ways. And that also needs to be brought together in terms of get, getting a bit of unity and in terms of connection before or before or even whilst we're trying to connect with a Jasper in Mauritius. So there's a lot of work there. I think we've progressed a fair bit and I like some of the work, but, but some of the work, I like the work that's been put together in terms of giving some sort of a structure within which to work and to exploit whether it's the human capital in terms of knowledge, whether it's the financial side of thing. But over on top of all this, I think one of the strongest link between the diasporas of Mauritians throughout the world and also in terms of connecting with Mauritius is the emotional connection. The emotional connection is very strong. Having said that, it's very strong within the Mauritian community, the older, uh, generation because they've got this 
this connection with Mauritius because they've lived there before they moved across. Some of the younger ones are connected, but it's going to be a much stronger, a much more, a much tougher task to get them involved. And uh, we need to get them involved. A lot of them wants to know more about Mauritius. One, one of the elements of which I've got a particular interest about Mauritian cuisine, all Mauritian kids, they love Mauritian cuisine and they want to know how. And that's a very, very strong connection. Talk to Mauritians everywhere, anywhere, food brings them together. So that's a very important link. I think the cultural link it's, it's, it's quite important. Having said that, I welcome all the findings and I think we all need to work together. The structure has been put together. We need to do more work on that in terms of getting people on board. There's still a bit of lack of trust in terms of a program and where it's leading and all the rest, like a lot of people were talking about, uh, about the transparency in, in, in between inverted commas sort of thing. In Australia, we've got this, um, this culture of everything is more transparent than transparent, which creates a, a few problems by itself. Whereas we tend to see with, with a Mauritian government, everything tends to be like kept, kept away or not quite open. So there need to be some, some adjustment to be done between the two. But overall, I think it's been, it's been good work. It's the beginning of it all. We just need to progress further within the framework that's been established. Thank you all for the work that's, that's been done. I'm quite looking forward to see where it leads to. It would be very interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clancy. Uh, indeed, cuisine was something that was mentioned throughout all of our research interviews. Uh, youngsters and older generations, they all had that in common. It actually brought them all together. So it's something very important. And it's part of that uh, cultural and social strand, actually. So uh, definitely needs to be tackled as, as far as recommended actions. Um, as far as the beginning of the journey, definitely so. We really remain hopeful that the relationships that we have built are based on mutual trust and that that will only continue and further strengthen. Thank you so much. Um, I will invite now uh, Bernard uh, to actually join in as well and uh, share his thoughts of the research journey and his feedback on recommendations. Okay. Um, let me know if you have trouble hearing me at all. Um, we, we can but, hear uh, you well. Okay, that's good. Uh, so, yes, my name is Bernard Bessoa. I live in Canberra, and um, my main connection to the Mauritian community diaspora is through the Canberra Community Radio Program, uh, which I started a few years ago, um, and which really plunged me into this whole world of community and thinking about and talking about community and that sort of thing, um, which has been a really positive experience for me. Um, I'll begin by saying that um, I think uh, the, hello, can people hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. I've, I've just got the, uh, the buffering sign here. That's all. Bernard, I think now we can't hear him. Let's wait for a little bit. Okay. Um, maybe we can come back to Bernard Martin. Yes, yeah, so, sounds good. Sounds good. And um, let's let's kick him with some questions and comments and reflections, and we can come back to Bernard when the connection gets better. So, first of all, I want to say thank you to Clancy and all the team and everybody involved. And we have a question from from Sheev, but keep feeding your questions in, and we we have some that were kind of sent in in advance, but also one, for example, that came in after the previous session. So what we will do is also address that question more broadly. So the first question from, from Sheev, which is a very timely one and a very important one, I think, is, is there any recommendations mentioned that are being implemented now, such, such as any action plan coming forward? So Amira, would you like to, to answer? Maybe Tanya may have some quick comments or reflections on that from, from my OM side. And I can also come in if helpful. Um, 
Thanks, Martin. Yes, I think uh, Tanya would definitely answer this question better. Uh, but um, as far as the recommendations, so uh, the first one that comes to mind is the actual action plan. So that is the first uh, uh, activity that will be and is being implemented uh, right now uh, in terms of designing uh, all the details of it, as well as uh, within the first trend of leadership and institutional development, the diaspora cell uh, that was uh, going to be built, I think, even uh, earlier earlier uh, last year, but uh, due to the pandemic, it will probably be uh, built sometime this year within the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs is uh, the first step towards that recommended action within that strand. Um, Tanya, over to you or Martin, over to you, whichever you wish. Yes, thank you, Emira. I think, uh, yes, you already answered the question, but just want to add on that. So that uh, some of you might be aware uh, that the, the recommendations went through cabinet and was approved, the, the report at least was approved on the, by the end of February. So as Emira mentioned, part of uh, the, the, the project that we're currently doing was to support the, the build up of a cell, the setup of a cell at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for Diaspora. So this was not, uh, this was delayed due to the pandemic, but we hope that uh, uh, this can be concluded this year or, or soon at least. And then uh, we are currently with your assistance working on this action plan to put all of these recommendations to make them all more so, so thank you. Thank you. I think uh, I will now like uh, over to Martin if he wants to add anything else. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. I think Bernard is back, so I, I can see him. So we, we can jump back oh, and come back to the question. No, you're fine, my friend. It's technology, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> right. So I'll, um, I'll, I'll hand back to you, my friend, and, and we look forward to hearing your reflections. Thank you. Um, can you tell me whereabouts you lost me? Was I talking about Diaspora Capital at that point? No, so it, it froze just before, I'd imagine, just before that section. Okay, well, I'll start back there. Um, I was basically saying um, I agree with what Amira said that, um, you know, about dias diaspora capital. Um, and uh, I think it's fair to say the Mauritian community in Australia has considerable diaspora capital. And um, I'm not just talking about money, um, I'm also talking about cultural and community capital. Um, and the Mauritian community is fairly passionate about deploying cultural capital and uh, um, diaspora capital, if you want to call it that, um, to promote community and culture. We're very proud people and we are proud of our culture. Um, that includes food, music, dancing, parties, um, family connections, all that, all that stuff. Um, very proud of all of that and sharing it with others and sharing it with a broader Australian community. Um, but there does it, it tends to be fairly locally deployed there are, um, and also uh, it lacks that kind of uh, overall coordination um, because uh, there isn't a kind of a formalized coordination of that sort of uh, capital um, in Australia. Uh, what that means is that sometimes people can fall through the cracks and I've been particularly concerned about the more vulnerable Mauritians who are in Australia, um, particularly at this time when there's so much disruption and uncertainty um, having access to reliable uh, capital, um, either from the Mauritian government or from uh, local people who are able to help. Um, one of the biggest things that I think we can do is connecting people who've been in Australia for a very long time with people who've just arrived in order to, um, to give them an opportunity to share what they, what they have and um, to have that communal community experience uh, because in particular, young students who come here, they're starting off. Um, sometimes it's just about helping them um, fill out Centrelink forms or, uh, fill, you know, uh, apply for um, university uh, forms and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, people who are here can do that a lot better. And there's a huge amount of um, possibility that we can help with that. Um, so that's kind of, that all pretty much is reflected in the recommendations that you've uh, put forward. I think there's an issue in terms of um, centralized coordination that we tend to think that that's better, but centralized coordination not done well is actually not necessarily better. So um, perhaps people would prefer an ad hoc approach where they were more in control of things than to have a centralized system that wasn't particularly uh, trustworthy or reliable and so there's an onus for um, this in this sort of approach to make sure that people have trust 
in the process that is being developed to centralize and coordinate. Um, and I think that you've picked up on that too. And some of um, what others have said reflects that too. Um, and the, the last thing I wanted to talk to a little bit was in relation to the um, young, younger generations. Um, I encounter them a fair bit in my work in, on the radio. And um, as Clancy did say, uh, they're, they're quite different and um, we're being forced in a way to think outside the box, which is actually a positive thing um, when it comes to young people and uh, younger Mauritians and even the concept of what it means to be Mauritian um, when your parents are the, the ones who were born in Mauritius and you were born in Australia or even your grandparents were from Mauritius, but your parents were born in Australia, which is we're seeing, we're seeing a bit more of that now. Um, and what, um, uh, and it's kind of almost been accelerated by the whole COVID situation and what's been going on. There's a lot of um, disruption and some of that we won't really get to the bottom of and see exactly how it is affecting things. But I think governments are maybe picking up that, that um, the idea of uh, migration and, and the flow of human beings from place to place is going to probably be one of the key drivers of wealth at a national level in the 21st century. So those countries who, who work that out well um, are going to be uh, the leaders and those countries that don't do a good job of that are going to lag behind. Um, and so there's uh, some thinking that must go into that. And part of that, I think, is about thinking about where what community means and uh, what people mean when they say the word community and identity. Um, and in the context of uh, the Mauritian community here in Australia, and particularly with younger people, um, I find that for those of us who were born in Mauritius, we have a pretty clear idea of what Mauritius is um, and what it's like. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily true of uh, younger people who were not born in Mauritius. What they tend to have is um, an identity that's brought together from different experiences from their parents and what their parents talk about, grandparents, perhaps um, family friends who are also Mauritian. And they kind of um, adopt that identity and they own it, um, but they fill it up with their own ideas of what Mauritian is. And within that context, there is a space for having a bit of a different conversation about what it means to be Mauritian, um, because we traditionally, I guess, tend to fall back on, well, if you were born in Mauritius, you're Mauritian. But um, with the, the future people, uh, what does it mean? And it, and it comes back a bit to culture and belonging and that sense of, I actually want to be identified as a Mauritian. I, I want to belong to this community, which is a really positive thing. And I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised that younger people are very passionate about this. And so, um, you know, the community organizers uh, in Australia think uh, are challenged um, and myself included, to, uh, to think about presenting Mauritianness and Mauritian culture to this new generation that may not have the background um, that, other, that older Mauritians might have and presenting that to them and saying, this is your, these are your cultural um, assets, the cultural heritage that we've brought here. Um, and I think um, in doing that, it opens up a slightly different conversation one of the things that's going to be a challenge for this process, I think, is that um, the, the Mauritian diaspora in Australia is not exactly the Mauritian community in Mauritius. There, there's, there's some value differences and there's some uh, expectation differences, um, particularly as regards the government of a particular place. Um, so there's going to be a conversation about what is expected and um, how that actually bears into uh, what is contributed and how it's kind of deployed and all of that stuff. Um, because, Mar because Mauritians who live in Australia have naturally slightly different life experiences and different expectations as to those sorts of things. And, um, and I think that's actually a positive thing. It will help um, because it is a conversation. I think that ultimately that's what it boils down to. Uh, we're opening up a conversation, not just along the lines of diaspora and Mauritius, but cultural community belonging uh, people coming here, migration, all of that stuff. Um, and so uh, where that goes is the establishment of formal mechanisms or slightly more formal mechanisms 
for having those conversations and hopefully building commitments into those conversations and resources into those conversations. And um, I'm very optimistic. I think that uh, you guys have really set out a, a framework that could work very well for having that conversation. I think good faith underpins. It has to be good faith on both sides and a, and a commitment to do things right. Um, but beyond that, the, the conversation is beginning to happen and I'm very positive that it will yield um, some fruit in the future that we will be all very proud of. So hopefully that, um, that sums it up for me. I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Bernard, for that elaboration and uh, all those points that you brought up, uh, which are very, very uh, important and actually crucial. And thank you for bringing them up. I don't know which one to start uh, mentioning and addressing first. Uh, there were so many, uh, but I'm super glad that uh, you feel challenged and other Mauritians feel challenged. Challenge is always a good thing. Uh, so uh, heads up to the youngsters, the Mauritian youngsters. Um, as you said, uh, their mentality and the way they look at uh, Mauritiusness can be very helpful uh, in terms of the change that needs to be brought up for diaspora engagement in the future. And that's something that we tried uh, to address a little within that framework, as you mentioned. And um, uh, the togetherness that uh, they are all brought up with the music, with uh, Sega, we've heard a lot about that as well. Uh, so we understand that uh, how they feel uh, that they are Mauritius, the relationship that they have and that they will build in the future may have positive effects actually on the development of the country too. There's quite a bit of uh, research on diaspora that shows that uh, whenever uh, there's remittances coming in from uh, female diaspora, members, uh, a lot of the patriarchy within the uh, home country and the systems within the family is uh, abolished and changed. So there's a lot of positive effects that can be brought as well as the work ethics and uh, a lot of attitudes that can be transferred uh, back home. In terms of uh, connecting people, and this is something that uh, Clancy also mentioned in the chat box I saw now in the Q&A, uh, it is very crucial, I, I do agree, to bring together Mauritians abroad within all the respective countries, uh, as well as within the pilot countries that we spoke to. Uh, as we kind of mentioned throughout the presentation, we have also noted that a lot of the uh, Australian uh, Mauritian organizations that we were talking to do not really necessarily collaborate with one another and there's quite a bit of strengthening and room there to engage and create a structure that is much needed to actually alleviate that sense of belonging as well as to have a relationship with Mauritius. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Clancy wants to add something and then maybe Martin, Tanya or Celine can also provide inputs. Thank you Bernard. Clancy? Thank you. Yeah I, I just wanted to add something that I did mention before and Bernard said the same thing as well about the expectations of Mauritians, Mauritians in Australia in terms of their expectations. It's very, very different. They've changed because in Australia, like I, I spoke about transparency, I spoke about openness, whereas in Mauritius, it's not that open and transparent. So we need to be some adjustments and even the different generations of Mauritians in Australia, they look at things differently like the older generation, the not so old and the younger ones and the Mauritians born, so those born of Mauritian parents here, the expectation is even different. So we need to reconcile all of that. It doesn't mean that it's a problem, but what we need to do is to coordinate and to generate all those forces together that can lead on to better things. So that's an important element. And the other element is the thing that I mentioned the Mauritian diaspora in Australia is fragmented in many ways. We need to bring this together. Thank you. Thank you, Clancy. Uh, back to Martin. Yeah, first of all, uh, it was a fascinating conversation. And, you know, Clancy, your, your, your point about the, the fragmentation of bringing it together reminds me of something a professor friend told me many years ago when I was a young student and he, he made this quite astute reflection and I'll bring you back to Ireland for a moment. He said, don't fall into the trap of thinking that Ireland has just one diaspora, it has many of them. So I think what we need to figure out is that coordination piece. And, and I think Bernard, you mentioned a key word in all of this and, and that's belonging. 
And I think what's, what's really fascinating for me and one of the biggest potentials, not just for Mauritius, but, but, but globally for diaspora engagement is that, you know, diaspora and migration are very closely related, but they're slightly different. And what's really interesting is that, you know, sadly and incorrectly, you know, migration has a very sensitive image in for, for a lot of people, you know, whether that's the political point of view or, or public confidence in the topic. But diaspora has a much more positive connotation. And, and we have a line that we use when we present quite a bit, and I'll share it now in a sense of migration is the language of borders and identity, but diaspora is the language of affinity and belonging. And it's a very powerful way of looking about the, the role of the, the positive role that, that diaspora engagement can do for for the narrative on migration, because I think, think we, we, we have a really interesting road ahead on that point. And I think, you know, what I really wanted to pick up on as well from, from Bernard, I think it was incredibly astute, was that sense of, of engaging with the vulnerable as well within the community. I think we, we all have a responsibility. I come from a very small island, Ireland. We're, we're an island off an island off the edge of Europe. You know, technically nobody should care about us, <laughs> but we, we, we quickly realized that we have this global family but what the Irish government do, for example, as well, is that, you know, we have to make sure that it's not just about engaging the successful members of the diaspora. Yes, that's very important for everything that we spoke about in terms of diaspora capital. But we often say the migration journey is one of struggle to success to significance. And the hard reality is that, that many migrants may stay in the struggling category. So we have a duty of care and ethics of care to, to the diaspora to help as well. And I think everything that, that you and Clancy have, have discussed about that coordination and building the community, that organically begins to help. So I can give a very small example of what I mean by that. And I think you mentioned it, Bernard, in a sense of, you know, new, new, new arrivals getting help from people that have been in the country for quite some time. You know, as I said, the Irish historically had two or three mechanisms to, to help each other. One was the Irish pub. I think everybody knows <laughs> that there's Irish pubs sprinkled all over the world. But we also have community associations and, and physical community centers for our diaspora. So when any Irish immigrant leaves this, this island and goes, they, they have a space to go to get help. So whether that's for, you know, immigration processes, whether it's for, you know, just that sense of loneliness that can come with this journey and, and things like that. But, but that's the system that and the spirit of what the recommendations is trying to achieve. So I see we have another question. And again, it's, it's from Shiv, and I want to link maybe this question to, to where we're going from. There was a final question there from webinar one that we didn't get time to address, so we want to include that in. So maybe if I open this up to the floor, just in terms of the, the two questions. So Shiv mentions cultural expect, expectation aspect, aspects of the Mauritian community in Canada is different compared to Europe and Australia. Long term, we can develop a linkage between the countries, but we need to share best practices and experiences in bringing, it, bringing everyone together. The starting block is to talk with each other and community leaders should keep talking despite the differences. So that, that, that's more of a comment and reflection. And I think, look, the quick answer is you're absolutely correct <laughs> from my perspective, Shiv. I think what's, what's interesting for us is that we, we saw incredible community leaders like Clancy Bernard and, and yourself, Shiv, and you're all doing incredible work, but, but you're doing it in, in kind of silos, if that makes sense. So the challenge or the opportunity, if you want to think of it that way, is, is how do we link them? And that brings us to, we talk, it's come up again and again, not just in the research, but, but this morning, for example, or this afternoon, this evening, depending on where you're dialing in from, was, you know, the different layers of, of the community. And the question that we received on Wednesday, Wednesday's webinar that I, I open up to, to Amira, and I, I'll, of course, provide some reflections as well, is what is the role of youth and women and promoting youth and women empowerment across these type of activities? Because I think it, it leans back into the point about the values led engagement and what those values come to represent, not just for current generations, but for future generations. So Amir, do you have any immediate reactions? I can give a much more detailed answer, but I, I, I'll open it back to you because you know, as the, the female lead of this team, I think it's only fair that, that you get first shot at this. <laughs> Um, as a feminist uh, of this team, but also yourself, I think you could give a fair shot at it as well. Uh, as far as the uh, the women and youth and the importance that they have uh, as 
vulnerable groups, so to speak, as well as other vulnerable groups, um, as mentioned throughout the recommended actions, as well as the reflections uh, that we noted throughout this research, uh, it seemed crucial also from the members of diaspora that we spoke to that um, there was um, mainstreaming of gender throughout uh, the policy um, development, as well as throughout all initiatives uh, that were to be developed for diaspora engagements. And the values that this brings across, uh, as Bernard was saying, even in terms of youth and their expectations and their level of connectivity are uh, quite different than of other generations. It's uh, crucial again to, to note that the diaspora of Mauritians are very different uh, and within different groups, they're not homogeneous, so they have different interests and that is something that needs to come across. Um, I, I wanted to mention actually earlier while Bernard was uh, also uh, addressing that point, that there was this uh, research quote that we had um, that was very interesting um, that actually depicts that there's different groups within groups and that there are fragmented uh, groups in Australia or elsewhere of Mauritians. However, as this quote says, they're all Mauritians in the end, it says, when we are at home, we stay within our respective communities, but when we leave, we are one, we are Mauritian. And I think this sense of uh, belonging and this sense of integration uh, from all uh, uh, different groups is extremely important when developing a diaspora engagement uh, plan. Uh, Martin, you can, you, can, you can add now. Perfect, look, I think you covered the most, the, the, the most aspects of it, but there is a simple reality, but particularly when we, when we look at the recommendations, the type of initiatives and recommendations, for example, such as the, the, the leadership network, the, the next generation camp, we see those as very practical opportunities to really celebrate and, and include gender, diversity and youth. So, so that's the more programmatic res response or, or, or reflection. But just from a personal point of view, you know, I've, I've been involved in, in some incredible diaspora women's networks. So, for example, there's the African Diaspora Women's Network, there's Turkish Win, which is the, the Turkish Women's International Network. And you just have to look at the research in terms of female led enterprises. And, and, and it's, it's smart policy to do this. <laughs> it's basically what, 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 I'm, what I'm trying to say. So I think, you know, you'll see in the spirit of the report and the recommendations, and I think the data and, and you know, the gender breakdown of survey respondents, for example, tell us that having really strong type of activities that can really mainstream gender and youth is, is incredibly important. But behind it all, it's just smart, a smart thing to do, to be honest. So and I think what's really interesting as well for us beyond that, and I think it comes back to the point of, of managing expectations. And I do want to I do want or maybe varying expectations. I do want to spend maybe just kind of a quick 30 seconds on that. You know, where you'll see it in the wider report, because what we're sharing this morning is the recommendations, but, but what we talk about, you know, the, the, the longevity and the type of relationships and how that gets built. And I think Bernard and Clancy have brought up communication, for example, and community building. So what I would say to the diaspora and people listening in on the call that have an interest in this topic for Mauritius is that this is the beginning of the journey. And in many ways, what's really unique and powerful about particularly what the IOM have done through this work is to, to look at that sense of how can we be the developer of development, if that makes sense. So how can we be the developer of the, the, the framework development to really make this flourish? So I just want to bring up that point of, you know, just think of this as a long-term vision and a long-term relationship and process. And that makes things manageable as well. You know, sometimes there's there's a, a reality of this as well that we need to realize that you know sometimes diaspora engagement does not work and <laughs> and one reflection I have on that from talking to people that have been involved in some of those initiatives is that quite often they, they get launched like fireworks <laughs> and they disappear very quickly so it's, a, it's about being slow methodical inspirational when we can but just doing things that work and, and hopefully from the recommendations you'll see those those type of activities will will flesh out so I, I don't know if 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 the colleagues have any reflections on that? Just give me a, a, a nudge or just jump in if you do. But we have a couple of quick, quick questions. Yes. Can you? Yep. Just to add on, yes. Just to add on that, Martin. On the so I don't know if you can hear me. You uh, can you hear me? No. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think it was just a bug from my side. So I was uh, I was just going to add on that question of uh, engaging more or of youth. Uh, 
diaspora. So IOM, so we currently have uh, a project in the pipeline, which is the pilot uh, youth diaspora volunteer program that uh, we will try to launch by this year. So with the objective like of strengthening cultural and emotional ties with the diaspora and having youth coming and contributing to Mauritius. So just wanted to to inform everyone on that and we'll look forward to have your support and contribution on that as well as we will start the implementation. So I don't know if Celine wants to add anything on that. Yes. Thank you. Uh, if I may just add a few things on, on that. So uh, the idea and we really hear and thank you so much, uh, Philippe and Bernard for your input is very, very valuable. And for all the comments of the people who are following us uh, live on Facebook or on uh, on Zoom. Um, I think what we hear is really the idea of bringing the diaspora together, um, of uh, talking to uh, each other. And but that's also where uh, at IOM we are here to support because it's also about how we can offer you ways or platforms to have those discussions. I think that some of the recommendations from these consultations are about that, you know, the different uh, platforms, the different conferences are an area to really discuss uh, those issues. And uh, one uh, very important comment that I see in the chat box as well is about um, the uh, involvement and the support of the government of, of, uh, of Mauritius. So that's where also uh, it's important to really have uh, all the parties discussing uh, together and really moving forward. And that's really the idea of, uh, of developing this action plan. This action plan is for the government, but of course there are some things that as IOM we will also bring with us and see how we can uh, from IOM side support the diaspora uh, so that they are empowered and they are valued and you can so that you can further benefit uh, further contribute to the development of of, uh, of Mauritius. So I think that's the that's the main idea is really for us to know how we can support you. As um, as it has been said, it is a it's uh, it is the beginning of a journey. Uh, it's the road is not straight. It will be very long, uh, but we will do that together. And I think that's the most important. And uh, the, from the experience in other countries, uh, sometimes it fails because we don't have that from the beginning, and because we sometimes we forget one party along the road. You know, we are uh, you know focused on the diaspora, but the government is not on board, and we must not also forget. The Mauritians in Mauritius. So it's really something that we need this kind of uh, symbiosis, this synergy that we need to, to create so that everyone is on board and really create something that is sustainable. It will take some time, but we are committed. As Tanya uh, has said, uh, more is coming. We are proposing some uh, programs and some initiatives, and we are eager to also hear about your ideas, your views on how we can better support you as diaspora in your engagement. So thank you. Thank you, Selena. Incredibly well said. And I think, you know, just picking up on the, on the point of, of government, there's a, there's a lot of great research out there on this topic. And, you know, what, what's really interesting is understanding the role of government in diaspora engagement. And there's, there tends to be kind of two schools of thought in the sense of the government being the implementer or the facilitator. And what's worked well globally is being the government more of a facilitator of diaspora engagement. So I, I just wanted to, to reflect that. We, we had a really interesting comment as well from, from Sandeep, I believe, who, who spoke about the, the ideas around tourism and, and traveling back to connect to Mauritius and, and the importance of that for, for cultural heritage and, and, and things like that for the next generation, but also looking at the, the cold hard economic benefit of it. And I think this, it's a really interesting point. And I can share a, a personal story that might help um, reflect that and again this is this is tough to say as a, as a very proud Irish person but if you think back to the, the last real financial crisis Ireland in many ways was 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 the the poster child of failure <laughs> in the sense of the, the economic reality of, of the situation but what the Irish government did for example in terms of, of diaspora tourism we had an initiative called the gathering and it was essentially what we what we're looking at in terms of the recommendation here it was a year-long invitation to the Irish diaspora to come back and visit. So whether they wanted to visit their long lost families, ancestors, explore different Irish historical sites or cultural sites and everything that goes with that. But that was one of the main drivers of getting Ireland out of the economic hole that we were in. 
It created incredible numbers of jobs in the tourism sector, which is incredibly important to Ireland. And it was done at a very re relatively low cost. And I think the reason I bring it up is it gets across this, this idea of learning from others, learning from others as well. So there was nothing unique about that idea for Ireland. We actually copied it from Scotland <laughs> across the water. So a couple of years earlier, Scotland had the homecoming. So again, what we what you'll see in the report, for example, is, is that we have we, we'll be able to sprinkle in where these types of initiatives have 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 worked elsewhere. And the reason why we can do that, and I'll finish on this point before we, we kind of begin to wrap up. We have a question or comment from, from Bella and we'll, we'll address that. The, 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 the challenge in it, if you will, for example, or the opportunity is that diaspora engagement is non-competitive. Non so somebody that wants to help Mauritius does not want to help Ireland. And, and what we actually probably lack in the sector is, is more sharing. It's one of the few sectors in the world that's actually non-competitive, so we can share as much as we want. So I just wanted to bring that up. So the, the final question that I can see, but Amira, please let me know if I'm missing anything and I can come back. And I think Celine may want to engage as well. So Vela asked in the chat box, can you give me reasons why it is a long and bumpy road to get the Mauritian government to engage with the Mauritian diaspora? I, I can go first on that, uh, Celine, if, if, if you will, because I think it's more addressed to, 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 to your own um, intervention. So, so for, uh, what, what we're trying to articulate here is not necessarily that it, it's going to be an arduous process. I think the signs from the government are very positive. You know, when you look at the willingness and eagerness to, to create a diaspora cell, it, it, it's more just to manage expectations in the sense of how, how long we need to look at in terms of engaging with the diaspora. We see this as a very much a long-term vision. So my, my general reflections of collaborating with government or interaction with government in terms of sharing the recommendations and the findings, is that they have been very open to us as researchers. They, they've wanted to hear the good, the bad, and the indifferent. So I, I wouldn't be overly nervous. I just think in, in, in any country, in, in most countries, there's always you know, some issues that will be sensitive. And you know, diasporas have opinions <laughs> and vice versa. Governments have opinions and it's about managing those. So I think the relationship can be built. I wouldn't be overly nervous about that. And I think we can get there, as Bernard and Clancy said, if, if things are you know, done in, a, in an open way, a, a very clear communication strategy and, and building the right type of partnerships. So, so that's my reflections on this, Celine. I don't know if you want to come back in um, or anybody else. Sure, thank you. Yes, very interesting question and a good one and important one. Um, I, I wouldn't answer for the government, of course, uh, but uh, my perspective on, on that is that, uh, well, it's, uh, it's not easy to engage with the diaspora because you know there's a lot of parameters to take into account and uh, like from the IOM's experience in like many countries and including in Mauritius I think that um, the issue of trust is the main thing that uh, hinders that in the sense that if the government approaches the diaspora they maybe you know they don't do it like necessarily you know uh with the right approach because they're not used to it they don't have the tools and everything and the diaspora is like reluctant and there's always this issue of trust and i think that's all in all what the important thing to um really keep from that is that the government is willing to engage definitely uh, there is a migration and development policy of Mauritius that has been adopted in June to 2018, where it's clearly mentioned that uh, Mauritius needs to further engage its diaspora. So since then, it has been there and um, it's a policy, so it's uh, definitely uh, a commitment. And since then, we have been working with the government to see how they can engage. And the reason why um, IOM has led this research is also because of this uh, lack of trust, uh, because it's very important also sometimes to have a third party uh, that is totally independent to uh, conduct that because it's easier also to engage and it's probably easier uh, for you to be uh, frank and honest in what you expect, what is right and what is wrong. Uh, as we said, you know, we are welcome to any feedback 
uh, whether it's something positive or not positive, because that's how we can uh, improve and move forward. So I think that's the main idea. And that's also the role of IOM is to see and to like be kind of this bridge to um, make sure that we move forward together. Um, but uh, yeah, engaging with the diaspora is really not easy because yeah, as Martin has said, you know, the diaspora, you are very, very strong. You have a strong voice, you have opinions, uh, you know, they are like difficult things also that have to be discussed. Uh, you know, it's linked to the Council of Services, it's linked to uh, the right to vote. So those are uh, questions that are not uh, easy to, to tackle. So the idea of engaging now is to see how we can, a uh, little by little, address all that and build something that is sustainable and build a partnership. So that would be my take on uh, this, uh, the, this question regarding um, the, the, the government's uh, engagement uh, with the diaspora. And if I may just uh, very quickly respond to another question that I see from uh, Sandeep relating to uh, the issue of, of traveling. Uh, so Sandeep uh, no, like, be, believe that uh, the recommendation about traveling is one of the bases uh, uh, to enable Mauritian diaspora to connect uh, and also to give the opportunity to younger generations to visit. So uh, definitely, so this has been uh, included in the report. And uh, just so you know, so um, this survey is part of, the, of an overall project. And as part of this project, we have set up uh, a technical working group here in Mauritius with uh, a different, uh, it's an interministerial and multi-stakeholder technical working group. So we have members of uh, like representatives of ministries, but also from the academia, from um, the civil society and from the private sector. And for example, we have a representative from, um, from uh, Air Mauritius. So it's definitely something that we know about. And as, as we move forward, we, we really want to see how this can be improved because uh, it's a reality. We know about it and we know that, you know, how can we offer um, younger generations the possibility to, to visit and to engage and not just to visit in the sense that to be tourists because the experience when you are visiting as tourists and visiting the family and when you actually leave are different. And that's also why we have uh, proposed this uh, pilot project for giving the opportunity to uh, a few uh, young uh, members of the diaspora to come to Mauritius for a few months and to work here and to contribute to the country and really reconnect uh, with, the, with the country. So we would be happy to also hear about your views about that because all of that will really help us in designing um, like useful uh, programs and tools that really are uh, meeting your expectations and uh, that are adapted also and can contribute to, to the development of, of Mauritius. So thank you. Over to you, um, uh, Martin. Thank you, Selena. That, that was incredibly detailed, so I appreciate that. And I think Bella has just posted a follow-up comment in the sense that like every diaspora, there will be differences in opinion. But as a government, you have to accept that and any elected government will face the same issues. I completely agree, Vela. You know, if you look at it, if you look at successful diaspora engagement programs from a governmental level, what's been really interesting is that we're, we're beginning to walk that path already through the research. The number one skill in diaspora engagement is actually listening and listening to your diaspora and giving them the space to do that. So, so I think we're on the same page and, 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 and genuinely, I want to come back to the travel as well, because I think it's quite similar in Ireland. You know, the, the really interesting dynamic at work here, particularly for engaging with the private sector, is that the private sector is waking up to the real commercial power of diaspora, diaspora consumers uh, as, as consumers. So what's really interesting, for example, if you want just anecdotal evidence of that, where we begin to see, and you would have seen it in the presentation from Amira about the Economist and the front page, the, the even a very simple thing like the appearance of diaspora engagement in, in trade publications, for example, is, is growing phenomenally. So what we're seeing is that the private sector now is, and not, and not just for the financial perspective of it, you know, for, for the skills and, and enhancing your competitiveness, the private sector in a lot of countries are, are really beginning to figure this out. And I think, you know, it would be remiss of us not to, to reflect on where we find ourselves, you know, sitting virtually in a room. Diaspora engagement for post-COVID economic recovery plans, particularly for smaller countries, is, is critically important. And it's something that we, for example, in Ireland, are also thinking through because small countries need their global friends advocating for them. 
and you don't have any better any better global friends than your own people. So, so the question is, how do you actually build that? So I, I think amazingly, we're kind of on time <laughs> when you're doing this in terms of technology. So the, the, fine, the final session where we, and I think we've, we've organically addressed it in, in terms of some of the next steps. So you will see more information and the, and the final report in due course, but, but, but also what we're doing is developing an action plan. From, from these recommendations. So I think Ymira would have shared the link earlier in the chat box. If you want to have a one-to-one -one conversation with us on this, you can you can, you can book a time there, or if you have any wider questions or reflections on the, on, on the webinar, because sometimes it can take a, a while to kind of digest everything and, and go through it in more detail. We are here, we, we want to have as many meetings as possible. You come find us, you know, we're easy to find. So I will hand back to Ymira maybe for any final reflections. And I just want to thank Celine, Tanya, and Amira, particularly for the presentation and her leadership on the webinar, but most importantly, Bernard and Clancy for giving up their time. And I finish on this note, and I'm, I'm not sure if Clancy knows this, but I believe he was one of the first people I actually spoke to about this project. And indeed, he may be the first. <laughs> so, so I want to thank them both for giving up their time on the weekend. And, and I want to say to everybody that was that was listening in, thank you for your interaction. Thank you for, for, for getting engaged. We have incredible people like Celine and Tanya really leading the journey, leading the journey in, Mar in Mauritius. So we're we're confident of of this leading somewhere positive. So thank you for your time, attention, and I'll hand back to Amira for any final reflections from her, her end before Tanya closes up. Thank you, Martin, and uh, thanks to everyone uh, for being here uh, today, but also for discussing all these matters in quite a detail. Uh, it's important that we have these conversations, and uh, I hope, as Martin said, that many of you will indeed schedule meetings with us, either through the link I shared earlier, but uh, also just via email or whatever uh, medium you prefer. Uh, the one point that was mentioned about uh, the sensitivities and the strong voice of diaspora and um, issues that uh, are brought up uh, here and there and the talks that they like to have to the government. Uh, I just wanted to uh, restate, uh, and if I didn't mention er earlier, that uh, as far as our talks with the diaspora, uh, you should rest assured that all the sensitivities that were shared with us and that will continue to be shared with us uh, will not be left unaddressed in uh, the recommendations and the research that we develop, as well as in the action plan. So it is crucial that we do have these conversations. And uh, as Celine said, um, in this case, we are fortunate and you are fortunate to have IOM as a broker, so to speak, and as that bridge to actually get there. Um, and it may be a long journey, but it will uh, succeed, especially with a diaspora like yourselves. On that note, um, I think I can speak on behalf of Martin as well, as we had quite a bit of conversations on this, but we have met incredible people while talking to the Mauritian diaspora uh, throughout these interviews. Uh, we have met even friends, I, I, I can say. Uh, so it was great uh, meeting you all. It was uh, great having you here in this webinar and the webinar held uh, on Wednesday. And uh, we actually have one more webinar lined up for Sunday. So in case you have fellow Mauritians that are uh, in different areas and time zones, please spread the word. Uh, there will be one more webinar of the same content, uh, but we just wish to engage with as many Mauritians as possible. Uh, thank you again. And uh, back to Tanya for closing. Thank you, uh, thank you, Emira. So I would just like to join you to say thank you to everyone and especially our guest speakers today, so Clancy and Bernard. So thank you very much for taking the time of I think of your busy schedule to to be part of this dialogue today. Uh, uh, we we want to keep hearing from you and well what can I say, could design the future with you. So just to go back to our tagline during the consultations last year, so uh, we, we hear you and we hope to make uh, your feedback uh, reflect our, in our work. So thank you again, Emira and Martin for, leaving, uh, for leading this research and this session today. As Emira said, don't, don't hesitate to share um, the webinar that we'll be holding tomorrow with your friends, networks and families if they wish to, to to further engage with us. Uh, on that note, uh, I would leave to Celine if she wants to say some closing word and I wish you everyone a good day, afternoon or night from wherever you are. Thank you very much. Thank you, no, just say thank you. Merci beaucoup. 
uh, please uh, book uh, like one-to-one -one, uh, meetings with Emir and Martin again. Uh, like everything is also uh, anonymous. I would like to stress that uh, it is. So uh, like, please feel free to really share whatever you have in mind and your ideas. Thank you again. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks all. See you. Have a good day. Bye.